Okay, chapter three, we jump into the evolution of health services in the United States. This is going to be a longer lecture because we've got a lot to talk about. Uh, kind of as usual, I've I've recommended listening to this at you know one and a quarter or one and a half speed if you can. Um, but we do have a lot to talk about, so it's going to take a little more time. So the basic uh, points we want to start with are. On the origins of all healthcare systems. So health is cultural. We've already talked about this. Understandings of disease and illness and disability are all grounded in individual culture and time and place and you know social beliefs. Now, healthcare, so health, the understanding of what is health is cultural. Healthcare, the actual treatment of disease, is also cultural and historical. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And I think it's kind of fun. Uh, so I, I, I hope you find it interesting too. Healthcare is an economic good. And this, um, this I want to make this point. So I'm trained as an economist. And when we talk about economic goods, there are a lot of different kinds of goods, right? So there's you know, healthcare, the actual delivery of healthcare is a good, education is a good, right? Um, uh, food is a good, like all these things are goods. And they are economic goods when there are limits to the amount of the uh, access to the resource. So for example, there's a limited amount of food, right? Um, and we can make more food, but then we have to sacrifice something else. Uh, so we make choices in our lives about how much time and effort we put into any one of these goods, right? So we could all probably work out more or cook better meals. We balance that against other things we're trying to accomplish. And that's what makes healthcare and health, in, in essence, a, an economic good is because there are limits to, and they require resources and there are limits to those resources that we have. And healthcare delivery is historical, right? No healthcare delivery system has emerged fully formed. Um, efforts to completely overhaul uh, uh, healthcare delivery usually doesn't go very well. Um, the ACA was probably the most significant change to healthcare delivery, certainly since um, since 1965 and the implementation of Medicare. Uh, and medic the creation of Medicare has created a, a lot of uh, lingering problems that we'll be talking about. And we, you uh, and everyone in American society will be dealing with. Okay. So let's start by going way back in time. This, um, this graph is called the hockey stick of growth, right? And I just love this graph. Um, basically we can go, so um, this goes, so the X axis is 1000, uh, uh, CE or common error or AD, depending on how you want to say it, right? So imagine like uh, a thousand years ago, right, to the year 1000, um, uh, uh, people were existing. This is the average amount of GDP per capita, right? So the amount of resources that any one individual had to live on. So we're talking about, you know, under a thousand dollars per person per year to live on. So imagine living on less than a, the equivalent of less than a dollar a day back here. And the average person lived like that. And they lived like that for basically all of millennia, all the millennia before that. So human homo sapiens has been running around somewhere between a hundred uh, on this planet, somewhere between a hundred and two hundred thousand years. Um, and so basically from prehistorical period through to about uh, the mid 1700s, the average human being was living on less than a, you know, about, you know, less than a dollar, a, you know, probably a little more than a dollar a day, let's say, or in equivalent of resources today, a little less than a dollar a day. And then something happens in the 1750s. And that something is called the industrial revolution. And suddenly we are able to harness uh, steam power, but not only it's not only a physical revolution in the sense of um, 
uh, of of you know creating power and communication and transportation, but it's a it's a change in the way we organize ourselves. Um, in the industrial revolution, we have the Enlightenment here. We begin to really employ science, um, and we have a social revolution that that um, starts to actually appreciate and glorify the creation of wealth through a industrial society. And at that point, after a hundred to 200,000 years, finally in about 1750, something really magical happens, mostly in, in the UK, right? In, 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 in England. And suddenly we are making so much stuff, so much more stuff. And the wealth of society just takes off. Right. And so this is a hockey stick because you imagine, right, um, imagine holding a hockey stick. It's got that long shaft that the player holds. If you imagine laying that down and then, you know, the part where you hit the puck, I don't know what it's actually called, but that part of the you hit with the puck, right, get this long shaft of time where everybody is, is suffering um, and living in misery. And then suddenly it takes off and we become wealthier than ever any of our ancestors could have imagined at any time uh, in historical past and everything changes. So we'll talk a lot more about this. I'm going to bring this graph back to you uh, later on, but I just want you to understand the human condition, normal for the human condition was grinding poverty, right? The norm for humanity for almost all of human history has been to live in grinding poverty. Um, and so uh, often we ask, well, you know, we, especially those of us who live in the United States, often ask, well, why are some people poor? And that's really the wrong question, right? So economic, one, one thing that economic development teaches us is that's really the wrong question because poverty is the norm. So really the question is why are we suddenly rich rather than, uh, and why are so many people now suddenly rich rather than why are so many people, why are there still people who are poor? So uh, one of the points you'll hear me make over and over again in this course is wealth is the ultimate social determinant of health. So last lecture, we talked about social determinants of health, the context in which we're living, right? And how that kind of helps determine the choice set that we have, the capabilities that we have to make the choices, the health behavior choices, such as, you know, eating healthier, uh, getting exercise, right? If you're living in this condition, the last thing you're really worried about is, oh, do I have too much fat in my diet? Am I getting enough exercise, right? You think this guy is actually worried about, you know, it, 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 whether he's getting enough exercise? Um, probably not. Right. Probably he's worried about is he safe? Right. Can he get enough food? Period. Never mind whether it's good food. Is he going to get poisoned by the waste that is floating in this? Right. Is there going to be a cholera outbreak? Um, are his children going to survive? And that is another point that I want to make. So you saw the hockey stick of growth just a second ago where the stick was pointed upward. Well, this uh, Our World in Data is a fabulous site. You should definitely go check it out. Uh, I've got a link right there under, if you click on source, you can see this. But this graph shows, again, going back in time. So here we have 300 BCE, but you can just keep on going back and keep on going back. What this graph shows is roughly 50% of all children under the age of 15, um, or roughly 50% of children, died before the age of 15 um, for all of human history up until, oh, the 1700s or so, right? So we start to see an improvement, right? Um, in the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, we start to see an improvement. And as we get rich, we that hockey stick of, you know, it, it, instead of showing this as a growth an upward trajectory, as the hockey stick of growth takes off this way, the percent of children who are dying before the age of 15 goes down, right? And now uh, uh, the global mortality rate of children 
um, is 4.3% in 2020, rather than 49% or 48% um, uh, through all of human history. So if you wanted to have, you know, two or three children to support you in your old age, uh, back in the day, you'd have six or eight of them because mo you know, half of them weren't, weren't going to make it at past 15. And then the other one, then, the, and then the probability of, of other ones dying later on from things like contagious disease, food poisoning, all kinds of other random awful things, um, was also quite high. So if you wanted to have a couple of sons and daughters to take care of you in your old age, you'd have a family of 10 kids because the probability was they weren't going to, you know, make it uh, to be able to take care of you. So this is just, you know, when we, is, it's really easy growing up in the United States or growing up in any other Western uh, society where we're relatively wealthy and relatively healthy. Um, the operating assumptions for almost all of human history were you're going to be grindingly poor and your children were going to die. Right. And so truly, truly we live in this incredible miraculous time. So I want to share that as kind of like, what's the baseline assumption. The baseline assumption is poverty and suffering. Right. And so the question is, why are we so much better off today than we were once upon a time? And what can we do to bring up everybody to this level? Because the United States is, you know, well below that 4.3%. Um, so another point of view, so this goes, this is a, another amazing graph, right? So this is um, grinding uh, dangerous poverty is considered by um, uh, uh, world development organizations to be about $1.90 a day, the equivalent of, uh, of about $1.90 a day below which you are at serious risk of of starvation and other other um dangers so way back in the dark days of 1981 i was uh about 11 years old back in 1981 riding around um my neighborhood on my huffy huffy uh bike uh with my 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 little wonder years buddies right and very lucky to be living in the United States because in 1981, 42% of the world was living on $1.90 a day, right? Almost half of the world population was living at, at a, a level of grinding, dangerous poverty. And in, in the 40 or so years since then, that number has fallen from 42% down to less than 10% of the world now living in grinding poverty. So another just miracle that corresponds with that hockey stick of growth. So let's look at that hockey stick of growth again. And what I've, what I like to look at is, and this is more of a more recent uh, uh, thinking um, in the, years after the so this is a western centric perspective of course but in the years following the fall of the roman empire we went into a period you know sometimes called the dark ages or the medieval period there was a um europe just kind of fell apart um and there was a lot uh, you know uh, the continent became a real backwater the place the happening places were the islamic world um so you know uh, uh and the and china uh during that period uh the islamic world uh to the east uh had a, a growing sciences and um uh and they were trading and they were trading and exploring and doing all kinds of stuff while europe pretty much became a backwater of of uh ignorance and um uh and violence um but what governed you know and what governed what little that governed uh europe during those those period that period was the catholic church uh and a reliance on tradition so there was very little um very little scientific advancement during that period um yeah, there's some, and we can argue about that, but like relatively speaking, very little, uh, very little changed. If you were born to the to a farmer, you know, 
Uh, you are likely to grow up and be a farmer, just like your father was a farmer, like your grandfather was a farmer, like your great grandfather was a farmer and so on. And, you know, back into the, you know, for thousands of years, there was very little change. Um, and, you know, very little, uh, again, very few resources. During this period up through the Renaissance, right, when a culture is poor, right, and it, and this this, I will say, is universal. So when a culture is very poor, there is very little excess available to provide for the social welfare of the least of your society. And yet, human beings have always had some forms of social wealth, institutions of social welfare. Um, so we would have, back in this period of time, we had um, alms houses, uh, facilities where people would be brought uh, that couldn't take care of themselves, right? And um, maybe didn't have family members to care for them. Uh, or they might be sick. And so uh, um, so we had these what what we what our book refers to as undifferentiated institutions of social welfare. And so this is a it's a good way to express it. This was a facility where if you had um, uh, a person with a demented old person who doesn't have any family to take care of them, you might have brought them to, say, a religious order that would take them in and provide them shelter and care. If you had, um, you know, uh, orphans, if you had people with some sort of other kind of, you know, blindness or other kinds of illness, the, they had these institutions that just basically provided care and shelter, um, uh, but at a very crude and simple level. Um, and not a lot of, you know, and, and not a lot of care. Cause remember people are living at this time. The average person is struggling to live at this time on just a couple of dollars a day. Um, and so there's not a lot of excess to give to these institutions to fund them to provide for uh, the care for the indigent. So we had these undifferentiated institutions, basically, that were just kind of general welfare institutions. And it and that happens up through the the Renaissance. So the Renaissance, and this is again Eurocentric perspective, something magical happens in the, you know, depending on where you date it. So we have, you know, it happened earlier in Italy because Italy had a trading relationship with the Islamic empire, but um, much of those, the learning and sciences of the Greeks and the Romans were lost after the Roman empire, but they were, they were retained ironically by the Islamic um, society. So they were translated from the Greek and the Latin uh, into um, uh, Arabic and maintained in libraries in um, in in the Islamic world, and then eventually they were brought back to Europe and translated back into you know uh, the vernacular of um, uh, of of the various European countries, and so we have you know some of the great you know Greek philosophers such as Hippocrates, who's the kind of uh, one of the early um, medical thinkers uh, from Greece, from, from, you know, ancient Greece that had a, an outsized inf influence on medical care throughout this period. Um, but we had a, a, a rediscovery of learning. So Renaissance, a um, rebirth of learning. And so a rebirth of using reason rather than tradition. So, so through this period, up through the Renaissance, from the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages, everything relied on tradition. You know, what did the Bible tell you? What did the church fathers tell you? Well, that's what we did because that's what we've always done and that's what we do. We don't challenge, we don't challenge um, uh, the learning of the past. And then some magical things happen, um, you know, around in the 1400s, uh, the printing press uh, comes about. And so communication, it's, you know, if you wanted to pass on some sort of written learning, just imagine this, books were incredibly expensive because books had to be hand copied. 
And so there just weren't very many of them as a result. And so society generally wasn't literate um, because why bother? There aren't any books to read to begin with, right? And then the printing press is invented and it become, and the cost of reproducing written material plummets to, you know, virtually nothing relative to what it had been. And so now we can transmit information and Martin Luther, uh, uh, the, um, uh, a a Catholic monk in Germany uh, leads the Protestant Reformation or in, starts the Protestant Reformation um, in part because he's able to print his objections to the traditions and the beliefs of the Catholic Church. Um, and that spreads like wildfire using this new fangled technology of the printing press, right? Um, and just imagine like how, you know, some of you probably are our digital natives, you grew up with social media. But for those of us who are a little bit older than you, maybe a lot older than you, right, that was a revolution. Like if you moved away from, from you know, a town where you'd been living, basically your friends were just gone, right? You, I mean, you could write letters or get on the phone every now and then, but, you know, today you can have meaningful relationships with people on a daily basis, real time, you know, through social media, maybe even with people you've never met, you know, all around the world. Um, so just think about, I mean, so, so think about that, but imagine an even more basic level of, of, you know, the printing press, it, it caused even more conflict in, uh, in Europe than had already been there, but it also brought about this, um, this possibility of the Renaissance. And so the Renaissance begins a the reemergence of reason and the reemergence of thinking basically thinking for yourself right and we need that transitional point into uh the enlightenment and so the enlightenment uh again is a is a rejection of tradition um and a focus on the use of reason and learning and this is when in this kind of transition between the renaissance and the enlightenment is when we have bacon creating the um, scientific method um other things that are happening during this period one of the things that triggers the renaissance or or comes kind of simultaneously um is 13 1345 so back here 1345 to 1350 is the black death the bubonic bonic plague sweeps through Europe and kills about half of the population, right? Just imagine that every other person, you know, is dead, right? Of a horrible, horrible disease. Um, uh, and by the end of it, half of the people, you know, are gone. So like, think of like the, um, what is that? The Avengers, you know, uh, or a uh, uh, movie where the, I forget what the, the blue guy is and he snaps his fingers and every other person disappears. Um, right. Except in this case, it's not just the snap of the fingers. They die horrible, painful deaths. Um, but by the end of that, half of people are gone. And what this does is it, it disrupts a lot of the traditional relationships because suddenly, um, labor is much less, uh, is much more scarce. And there's an incredible draw to the cities people, you know, and people start leaving farms that they had worked on for generations and generations to move to the cities. And that creates a situation where landowners suddenly have to pay better. Um, and they have to start thinking about now with less labor available, they have to start thinking about how can I run my farm with fewer, with less manpower. And so there's suddenly a need to innovate, right? To come up with different farming implements and so forth. So the Renaissance is this function of a whole bunch, a kind of a, a coming together of all these different um, uh, macro events that are happening, the printing press, the bubonic plague, um, right? And suddenly there's this spark of learning and remember, this is all happening at the kind of the upper crust of, of society. Uh, it hasn't filtered down yet, but it is a radical change in the way we think about uh, the way society thinks, literally thinks, um, you know, uh, and people begin to think for themselves in the Enlightenment. We begin to have this idea of human rights, right? So um, the idea that individual human beings have rights is like this kind of crazy, like back here, it's like this crazy idea, you know? Um, of course we have a, you know, a hierarchical um, uh, society where some people are better and more important than others. And we get to the enlightenment and we begin to say, wait a minute, no, you know, all human beings are equal. Like that's a crazy idea that again, we just take for granted. Um, 
as if that was a thing, um, but it wasn't a thing for most of human history. And I'm talking about this in a healthcare class because you have to understand everything we think about for healthcare is embedded in this social on in these social beliefs. And so as we begin to unleash the power of science um, and we allow science to function, because remember like uh, individuals like Copernicus and Galileo got into trouble for saying things like, Hey, the earth, the, the earth is not at the center of the universe, this, uh, you know, or at the center of the solar system. The sun is actually at the center of the solar system. The sun doesn't go around the earth. The earth goes around the sun. And so they threw these guys and, you know, the, the church fathers threw these guys in jail for saying that because that was the tradition, right? But it was taking that, you know, it was, it was the emergence of science, of mathematics uh, in this period that, um, uh, creates this explosion of wealth that happens starting at the kind of the mid 1700s, about 1750 is kind of where we mark the beginning of the industrial revolution and the, just the unleashing of modern society and the power of creation, um, that creates all this incredible wealth. So we start to see in the 1700s or so, an explosion of wealth. And I realized down here doesn't look like it's all that much, but that's like three or four times, you know, like people who are living in 1800 were like, you know, 10 times as wealthy as the, as the people who had come before them. And we had had thousands and thousands of years where basically everybody was the same as their, you know, had the same amount of wealth as their grandparents and all their parents who came before them. And suddenly we have this incredible explosion of wealth and it just keeps on going. Right. And so as society begins to have more resources available, as we're moving away from living on a couple of dollars a day, there's more resources to give to the poor. Right. And so what we start to see is these undifferentiated institutions of social welfare begin to kind of bifurcate right, and, and split into into institutions for the indigents, so just the poor and institutions for the sick. Um, and then, uh, as we continue to get wealthier, we start to see, and it all kind of happens, right? Like, that's why this is stacked up here. It all happens very fast when we're thinking in terms of thousands of years, all this revolution starts to happen very fast. We see, you know, science is being applied to medicine. So first it's applied to astronomy and other things, but then it begins to be applied to medicine and we're using testing and the scientific method to explore instead of just looking at what did Hippocrates say 2,000, 2,500 years prior. Um, and so we start to apply science to medicine and we begin to see organized medical institutions. So we start to see hospitals, right? Now, hospitals are emerging back here uh, to some degree, but very primitive form. Um, and uh, but we're now what we start to see are organized medical institutions coming in the 1800s. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, we see industrial organization being applied to these institutions. And we see advances, you know, reason and science are continuing to be applied. And we see advances in medical institutions and training. So physicians were... Mm, there wasn't much to be said for physicians. They learned, uh, you know, they learned the traditional medicine uh, of history and it just didn't do much. And this is one of the important things you should realize. And we'll come back to this. Medicine really, for the most part, didn't work. You could go to the most sophisticated physician in 1750 and one of his main tools to treat you would have been to bleed you if you had to like cut open your arm and make you bleed was a was cutting edge and i used you know pun intended cutting edge treatment for things like a fever now nothing good comes from make cutting someone open and making them bleed especially if you're using a dirty knife right um medicine prior to this you know prior to the mid 1800s probably did more harm than good um and so it is in through the application of science to medicine that medicine actually begins to work right so prior to the 1850s or so medicine was just you know cultural authority and a lot of mumbo jumbo and probably did more harm than good um 
But as we move through the 19th century and we begin to have things like germ theory and understand that there are germs, right? And we come up with all these other innovations. Uh, we begin to have a standardization of medical training. We have nurses actually becoming trained instead of just being some, you know, the third daughter of somebody who didn't have room for them in their house anymore. And, uh, um, and so through to today where we have these consolidated systems of healthcare delivery um, and private health insurance. So I'm going to talk a lot more in detail here, but I just want you to understand kind of the key takeaway here is prior to about 1850, healthcare stunk, right? It really wasn't good. It was really dangerous um, and probably did, you know, your typical doctor probably did more harm than good, right? It wasn't until we hit the 1800s and the forces of the Enlightenment began to apply science uh, to medicine that, along with this incredible explosion of wealth, which brought us better nutrition, um, cleaner places to live, did we also start to have medicine that actually worked. All right. So what do we want from a healthcare system? Well, we can think about a lot of stuff, and I'm gonna, you're going to hear me keep saying Cost, quality, access, right? We want medicine that actually works. We want it to not break the bank and we want it to be easy to get to. We want providers to talk to each other and we want it to be patient-centered, meaning we want the doctor to actually listen to us and not just do whatever the heck they think they're gonna, they wanna do, right? So does this imply that, <clears throat> um, and and your book is very heavy on, again, I'm gonna talk you know about your book and because I've run, I have disagreement with them. They would very, you know, your authors really admire the National Health Service in, 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 uh, in the UK, which is a government-run, government-funded, government-provided healthcare system. But I ask you this: Can the free market also provide these goods? And I'd like you to consider as you think about that: Should the government provide healthcare? Well. What about other economic goods like food, telecommunications, banking, entertainment? Would you also like the DMV to provide you with your food? Would you like the DMV to run, you know, Netflix? And if you say no, then I'd like you to think again about whether you'd want the DMV to run your de Department of Motor Vehicles, right? Um, would you like to have the DMV run your health care? Um, so uh, your book talks about kind of four main stages of healthcare evolution in the United States, the pre-industrial where, um, you know, basically it was unorganized. Anybody could hang out a shingle, literally anybody could hang out a shingle saying, I'm a physician. There were no laws saying that, you know, if I decided tomorrow that I, you know, I'm tired of teaching classes about healthcare, I'm going to just start doing me some healthcare. Um there were no laws preventing me from doing that through most of, of, of us history. Now that didn't mean anybody was going to believe me or come to me or pay me. Um, but I could just go ahead and do that. And a lot of people did, um, post-industrial kind of, uh, period. So this is the early 1900s. So the early 20th century, um, you start to see kinda, the emergence of, um, of a medical profession, nursing profession, you saw medical licensing. So now any, you know, nobody could just, people couldn't just hang out a shingle and start doing healthcare. Uh, then in through the fifties, you see the beginning of a, <clears throat> of um, because of forces and uh, hap acting on, um, uh, on small providers, you see a, uh, coming together of small providers. And then more recently, you know, in the last 15 years or so, you see healthcare reform with government really putting, um, uh, and in particular, the ACA really uh, putting a lot of force on the system. So let's look at each of these uh, individually. So again, 1700s, 1800s, medical practice, for the most part, unregulated states at different states had different policies, but it was really uh, pretty wacky, right? Anybody could do anything. And it was, you know, the, the, there's a Latin, there's a Latin saying caveat emptor, which means, you know, buyer beware. Um, so, you know, 
some some guy says he's a doctor, ah, you know, um, you could ask him for a medical degree, and I'll tell you, the medical degree wouldn't have done much anyway. Uh, medical education in the United States primarily was an apprenticeship uh, process. So somebody would uh, go to uh, decide they want to be a doctor. They would apprentice themselves to a doctor for a couple of years. That person would sign a letter saying, this person, I've trained this person, and they uh, are now physicians. Um, and that was all it took. Um, there were colleges um, that had, you know, there were medical schools that operated quite early uh, in our history, but most of them involved like medical school consisted of basically two semesters uh, of training and then off you go. Um, uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. And your book goes into that really. So economists and political scientists talk about uh, state capacity, which is the ability of a state to pass laws and then actually enforce those laws. So in, you know, in pre 1800s, even really pre 1900s, um, you had a lot of very loose regulation in the country because government just wasn't very effective, right? It didn't have a lot of capability to regulate. So you might, you know, some uh, some state might pass a law saying, you know, you have to be licensed, you have to have this much training, but good luck enforcing it because you didn't have the capability to enforce it. And the other thing that you will talk about quite a bit is in the, one of the things that makes the United States really unique um, is the United States is a federation, meaning we have states, right, that are not, um, the states are not the local chapter of the federal government. They are independent entities with the right to regulate and act independently from the federal government within certain constraints. So the constitution basically says almost all economic regulation happens at the state level, not at the federal level. The state, the federal government has the right to regulate economic relations between the states, but doesn't, isn't supposed to, according to the constitution, have the ability to regulate um, economic activity uh, 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 across the country. So where what results from that is all physicians, all nurses are licensed, have licenses from individual states. So if you're practicing medicine in New Hampshire, you have to have a New Hampshire license. And if you want to go across the border into the, you know, south of the border down to that wild and crazy Massachusetts, uh, you have to get a Massachusetts license to practice medicine in Massachusetts and likewise in Maine or Vermont. Um, uh, and that is the result of our constitution saying economic activity, economic regulation is regulated primarily by the states. Um, so there's no such thing as a U.S. medical license. It is a New Hampshire medical license, a California medical license, or whatever state, right? So those are important points to make. Now, what did pre-industrial um, state of the art, I'm putting that in scare quotes, state of the art uh, medicine look like? Well, it had its origins in ancient Greece. So 450 BC or BCE, whatever you want to call it. So it the four humors um, model of medicine uh, was developed by Hippocrates. Now, Hippocrates was a, so he was a, sci a, a, a proto-scientist, right? A, a, a you know, a, a, had a scientific approach. He was doing experiments and making empirical observations. He was looking at reality. And I was reading about this not too long ago. He developed this idea of four humors. Um, and the four humors were the um, uh, uh, fire, air, water, earth, right? And you had um, choleric, sanguine, sanguine, phlegmatic, and melancho melancholic, sorry, you had fire, air, water, the elements, right? And they were associated with these kind of um, uh, uh, personality types of hot, wet, dry, cold, which then led to uh, humors of choleric, sanguine, uh, phlegmatic, and melancholic. And it's got this very much like an, um, um, I don't know, uh, uh, not astronomy, but uh, what do you call it? Uh, astrology right so like this is basically about as scientific as saying well i'm a gemini and so therefore uh or you know i'm a 
Pisces. And so therefore you should treat me this way. Like there's a, there's not a lot here. Now, where did they come up with it? Well, what they, what they, um, the original theory came, apparently uh, they had a blood sample from someone who had died of uh, some sort of um, a blood infection. And so when the blood sample settled, uh, they left it in a, um, they left it out for a period of time and eventually it settled into four layers. So they had like a, uh, you know, a, a red layer and a yellow layer and a, a black layer. And, and basically they had four layers. And so that was the source of the four humors. And that was a, you know, and that's a, okay, that's a, that's a scientific observation. Like we're looking at, at nature and we see these four layers that builds our, you know, Hippocrates builds his uh, theory of, of four humors, which then they tie back to the, you know, um, the four elements and it's pretty clever. Right. Um, and you could say that's a scientific observation. We uh, looked at li it looked at the world. We saw this thing. Well, this becomes the basis of medicine for the next, you know, so from 450 to the mid 1800s. So what is that? Like 2200 years. That's the best we can do <coughs> for about 2200 years. So um, I love this story. I mean, it's a sad story, but um, Mount Ver. So George Washington, uh, you know, uh, first president, leader of uh, leader of the um, uh, of the revolution, um, you know, retired uh, after his presidency and uh, was living at Mount Vernon, his home at Mount Vernon. Um, and he. Uh, he develops a sore throat. It's not clear what it was probably, you know, probably strep throat or something like that. And so they call on um, Dr. James Craig, who was the equivalent of the U S surgeon general at the time, and probably the most respected doctor in America. Um, and he begins to treat George Washington uh, over the course of two days. And um, he bled Washington four times Uh draining ultimately nearly 40% of his blood. He received an enema, right, to clear out the bowels. He received an emetic, which means something that induces vomiting. Um, they applied uh, blister agents to his legs to basically use induced chemical burns to his legs. And he ultimately finally said, you know, at some point said, hey, enough, stop. And he passed away. Uh, on the the following day, and so the each of these treatments, um, and I I don't honestly don't know uh, other than I know they used um, uh, uh, blood is associated with uh, with a fever, and you know each of these is <coughs> excuse me. So in if if someone was had a fever, you would bleed them. If they had you know some other problem going on, you would give them an enema or you'd make them throw up or you would uh, apply those those chemical agents to their skin and burn them. Um, and the and it was all based on this theory of the humors, which is just completely bonkers today from our perspective, but was cutting edge. He's literally was getting the best health care that was available in 1799. And honestly, he would have been better off. If they just left him alone. He would have at least had a chance to survive. But if you drain somebody of 40% of their blood, you're doing real harm to them <clears throat> separate from uh, any disease. So pre-industrial America, we see um, you know new Americans uh, striking out for the frontier. They are, as a group, poor, desperately poor and isolated and self-sufficient by necessity and frankly, by choice. These are some ordinary people that are looking to get away from um, the tradition bound class oriented hierarchical societies of Europe. And they're coming to America looking for a better opportunity. If you were born the second son or the third daughter of some poor family uh, on a farm in Ireland or, or England or, you know, France, you were never going to own land. You were always going to be poor. You were going to be, you weren't just going to be poor. You were going to be grindingly poor. And so 
the Americas were desperate for labor. It's part of why we had slavery was we couldn't get enough labor uh, to do the things that needed to be done in the United, you know, in pre-United States, in, in the Americas. And so in the colonial period, people would would come over as indentured servants. Somebody would be would write back to Europe and say, hey, I'll pay the, you know, the fare, the passage uh, for you know, for a young man to come over to, to America and he has to work for me basically at slave, you know, wages, um, for, uh, for the next 10 years. And after that, he's free to do whatever he wants. And so people would do that because at the end of 10 years, you had the chance, um, to make a new life for yourself. You could strike out for the frontier where there was land to be had to, to for free, right. Setting aside the fact that there were already, uh, Native Americans living there, um, you know, and I don't want to get into all of that, but the people who were coming to the United States or to what became the United States were coming because they were desperately poor. Um, so we also saw in this period, traditional healers, right? There were a lot of herbalists, uh, Native American healers called at the time Indian healers had a lot of, of cachet, despite the fact that we were also trying to run them off their land. Um, we had a, a whole set of people called bone setters. So, so, you know, these were often families that passed down the lore of how to, you know, set broken bones and midwives, you know, universal midwives, uh, to deliver babies. Um, it was only later, um, as the, as medicine became a profession that men took over, uh, the delivery of, of babies, it, you know, all through human history, it had been older women with experience delivering babies. So surgery, surgery was done without anesthesia. Anesthesia was invented in around in the 1850s. Um, as a result, speed was critical. It was commonly performed by barbers. If you've ever seen a barber pole outside of a barber shop, um, the red and white twisty um, uh, uh, pole represents blood and bandages, right? So uh, a barber pole was an indication. It was an indication that this person didn't just cut hair; they also cut off legs and arms and what else. Um, you, we could not do any complex surgeries because they had to be done as quickly as possible. Um, but we still did they uh, in the in the you know in this period, um, they recognized, for example, breast cancer um, needed to be treated with mastectomy. So imagine getting a mastectomy without anesthesia, and they did it, and they did it regularly. So and that was cutting edge, right? literally cutting edge, um, incredibly primitive understanding of epidemiology. They had this thing called spontaneous generation. So this is a picture of maggots, fly maggots. So these are larval flies would appear on, you know, dead animals and pieces of meat. And supposedly the, the, this is sort of an Aristotelian, like, again, going back to the Greeks, <clears throat> this idea that, uh, larvae would spontaneously appear the meat would transform into larvae. What they they couldn't see and didn't understand was flies would land on the meat, lay eggs, and then the eggs would hatch and become, you know, larva. But they had this whole idea of spontaneous generation. It was like a medicine was not all that different from magic uh, throughout most of human history. So in this pre-industrial period, we see the emergence of hospitals. I kind of mentioned this. Now, most care through the, 1900s was provided at home. Only the destitute went, for the most part, only the destitute and those without families went to hospitals. Hospitals in North America emerged from those really primitive institutions. So we had almshouses. So we had the, you know, we had that that great general kind of uh, institution for 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 care. Eventually became kind of three different um, forms of care. So you know, almshouses were kind of for the homeless. Pest houses, we put people who had uh, disease, so we tried to isolate them, and asylums uh, emerged for the care of the mentally ill. Now, medicine was low-tech and low-value. Again, <clears throat> couldn't do much. Theory wasn't very valuable. There wasn't much you could do. You just basically tried to make people comfortable. 
leprosy. Uh, uh, it's long history uh, of lep, you know, of 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 this kind of vague idea of leprosy. It probably meant a lot of different things of various skin diseases, but this is this is a picture of a woman with what we today call leprosy or Hansen's disease. Um, it is a uh, disfiguring disease that affects the colder. It is a it is a um, bacterial infection, and this particular kind of bacteria likes to live in the cooler parts of the body. So it affects your fingers um, and your extremities. So it's fingers, toes the tip of your nose, your ears, and you can see, so you can see her hands have uh, been worn down to stumps, her nose and face, her eye, eyelids tend to kind of start to uh, rot away. Um, what happens is you lose, uh, uh, as the bacteria sets in, it, it destroys the nerve. And so the feelings in your fingers and in your extremities, and over time you injure those extremities and then they become infected and they, um, are destroyed, right? And eventually you die from this. This is a, was an incurable disease and just a horrifying disease. So when we talked about pest houses, this was the kind of thing you would confine, a person who was diagnosed with leprosy would be confined to a pest house. So I lived, I was uh, stationed in Hawaii for a few years and there was, and Hawaii is a chain of islands, the main, um, the, um, uh, Oahu is the is the capital island where Honolulu is, um, but there was an island called Molokai, and so from 1866 to about 1969, uh, so Hawaii is one of these areas where leprosy uh, really takes hold, um, and leprosy is a real problem. Other it, it, it leprosy likes uh, warm but not too hot. Uh, climates, uh, warm, wet climates. So we saw a lot of leprosy in Hawaii. We saw a lot of leprosy in Louisiana um, and other parts of the South. So from 1866 to 1969, uh, uh, about 8,000 Hawaiians were sent uh, into exile in a place called Kaolopapa, uh, which is a village uh, in Molokai. Um, so you can see these incredibly steep cliffs. The rest of, of the population of Molokai lived on the other side of these cliffs. So there's this little area on one side of the cliff that, uh, on one side of the island that was basically inaccessible except by boat. Like you couldn't, I don't know, if you were a really good mountain climber, you could get up over the over that. Uh, but if you had leprosy, chances are you were not going to climb that mountain to get to the other side where the rest of the population lived. So what would happen uh, is if you were living on Oahu and the health inspector discovered that you had had or might have leprosy, they would grab you, drag you from your home, uh, uh, imprison you briefly in Oahu, uh, uh, excuse me, in Honolulu, and then put you on a ship uh, and bring you to Kaolopapa, where they would, you know, unceremoniously dump you off with a bunch of, um, you know, with uh, whatever clothes and food they might be bringing um, and leave you there. And this, this Kalopapa had a, you know, basically was like a Lord of the Flies situation where there was no governance. It was brutal. People stole from each other. They stole from the, as people got sick, they basically just threw them in a corner and they took all their stuff and no one was there to care for these people. It was brutal and and cruel. Um, but again, poverty, uh, drives this sort of thing, right? When we are poor and there are no resources and there is no cure, this was the best. So that I don't mean to, to criticize. I mean, I do criticize, but I, I, I also want to look at this with some empathy that when society doesn't have any resources to take care of the sick, they do the best they can. And this was the best that they could do, uh, or maybe not, because um, a Catholic priest um, named Father Damien uh, found out about the condition in Kaolopapa, and he was a uh, French-Canadian priest who um, uh, had come down um, uh, from Canada and was serving <clears throat> serving uh, the population uh, in, in the United States and uh, heard about uh, the need in Kaolopapa and volunteered. Uh, to go there uh, and serve the people of Kalapapa. 
And what he found was a horrifying, the horrifying circumstances that I described. And he brought, he brought a, uh, he brought mercy uh, and he brought uh, kindness and he brought some degree of humanity back to Kalopapa. And he lived there until he succumbed to leprosy himself. And for those of you who find that interesting, <clears throat> find this sort of thing interesting, he is the first Catholic saint um, uh, sainted in in the United States. Um, and I don't know the details of, of his supposed miracles, but just the um, healthcare is has incredible stories of kindness and sacrifice uh, throughout. Uh, and this is just one of those great stories. So transitioning to the post-industrial era. So as we go into the 1800s through to the mid 1900s, and these are going to be overlapping. Um, what we see are medical technologies that actually start to work, right? Um, so we start to see uh, anesthesia where we can do uh, procedures uh, that, you know, we can do, um, you know, uh, uh, surgery without pain. Um, but we also see an urbanization and concentration of the population, right? So we see people moving to the city. So in the 1800s, something like 95% of Americans lived on farms in rural areas. Uh, by uh, today, something like 95% of Americans live in urban or suburban environments, and only about 5% live in rural areas. So it's a radical change. But that change brought about a whole slew of of dangerous um, uh, uh, contagious diseases. Uh, they brought about challenges of managing sanitation and managing uh, safe water. What we see during this period of the 1800s and 1900s is the emergence of the medical Associ American Medical Association and the creation of professional licensing for all the different kinds of medical care that we get. Uh, one of the things that the AMA does is it really goes out of its way to uh, eliminate competing um, medical practitioners. So I mentioned in um, in lecture one, I talked about medical doctors, MDs, and DOs, doctors of osteopathy. So those so doctors of osteopathy were a competing medical um, physician type, and so the AMA did its best to uh, to run all the DOs out, right? They failed, but they were successful in eliminating a lot of the other types of medical practitioners with the goal of narrowing what was acceptable medical training and narrowing the who could call, be called themselves a physician. Um, and this began even before medical practice had any meaningful point. And this is an economic struggle, right? Because if doctors can reduce, if, if the AMA could reduce the number of people who called themselves, legitimately call themselves doctors and who could pr practice medic medicine legally, that would drive up the salaries of the doctors who were remaining. So it's a, there's always a connection between health and wealth. Um, one of the, one of the major events that's happening in this period is the develop of, uh, uh, antisepsis and aseptic technique. So um, uh, Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis was a German physician um, practicing in an obstetrics hospital. Um, and he was, and, and this hospital was divided into two parts. There was a fancy expensive part for upper-class women that was staffed by, by physicians, formerly trained physicians like, like Dr. Semmelweis. And there was a uh, other half that was was um, uh, run by midwives and for the poor for poor people, and one of the things that Semmelweis noticed was there was this terrible disease called purple or child childbed fever, and it killed women shortly after they gave gave birth, and Doctor Semmelweis noticed that more women on the wealthy side where they were supposedly getting you know premier care were dying from purple fever than the women in um in the uh, uh midwife side and he put together physicians would deliver a baby then they would go to the morgue that was attached to the um 
attach to the hospital and do um, an autopsy on any of the women that passed away, in particular for from childbed fever. And then they would go back and deliver another baby. And in between doing this, the the autopsy and delivering the other baby, they wouldn't wash their hands. So they would have literally have the blood of women who had died of a bacterial infection on their hands. And then they would be going to deliver a baby from a healthy mom um, and infecting that woman. Now they didn't have, they didn't have germ theory at this point. And so Semmelweis is just trying to figure out the causa causation but what was really happening was they were infecting otherwise healthy women with with this purple fever, and then these he other otherwise healthy women would then succumb to purple fever. And Semmelweis, not knowing germ theory, not really understanding what was happening, thought, well, you know, here, let me try this. Let me wash my hands. And he washed his hands with pretty harsh stuff. He used lye and some other things, right? So it's really harsh um, uh, uh, treatment that eliminated um, the germs on his hands. And he found that his patients were not dying at the same rate. And so he went to his colleagues and he said, hey, let's all wash our hands after we do autopsies, especially on women who've died of purple fever. And his colleagues were like, we're not going to do that because having blood on our hands shows us how, how shows the patient how sophisticated we are as physicians and so they refused to wash their hands and not only that they eventually ran him out of practice uh uh from the area and uh, he was kind of a disagreeable dude um uh but and spent the rest of his life kind of complaining about how he'd been wronged but he really is kind of the father of uh antisepsis which is <clears throat> Um, trying to, uh, uh, sorry, aseptic technique, which is um, trying to make sure that you're not introducing uh, disease into um, by, you know, into the, um, into the patient. So he was cleaning himself such that disease wouldn't be introduced. And this is why you see surgeons today, you know, gowning up before they go into do um, uh, procedures. Uh, is to try to keep bacteria from coming into the into the OR where they're doing their procedure. Antiseptic technique is once there's an infection, we try to kill the infection. So aseptic, we're trying to keep the infection from happening. Germ theory. So again, some of us didn't know what a germ was. <clears throat> we didn't develop germ theory until the 1860s. And Louis Pasteur uh, was able to prove that food spoiled because of bacteria, not because of spontaneous generation. Um, and these discoveries that he made were the basis of penicillin in 1929, which was one of the first um, uh, 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 medications capable of killing uh, and stopping bacteria. Um, the X-ray, another incredible discovery um, in 1895 by Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen, um, and we still measure x-rays in form of Rankins. And this is uh, uh, his first x-ray was a picture of his wife's hand. Some other exciting um, medical discoveries were anesthesia. Per first uh, uh, surgery performed under anesthesia at Mass General. Um, uh, aseptic technique, right? We talked about, you know, keeping um, uh, 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 exposure, um, sterilization techniques. So we're like, hey, you know, maybe we should clean those knives before we use them to cut on some other patient. Uh, preventing uh, uh, infection in surgery, x-ray imaging, and penicillin, um, you know, antibiotics. What we see in this period is, is kind of a physician hospital codependence. So, um, and this comes about because technology is really expensive. Uh, you know, I, an individual physician couldn't afford to have radiology technology in his office. And so they couldn't afford the sophisticated laboratory techniques, surgical suites that actually provided, you know, uh, uh, a safe aseptic uh, conditions. Um, trained nurses uh, became really important. And so the hospital becomes a focal point for technology. It becomes a place kind of a, it becomes what I like to call a doctor's workshop where you all the doctors support the hospital getting all these technologies and then they share them um 
And so the doctor's workshop and a lot of hospitals become not for profits at that point because doctors don't want the hospital to compete with them. Um, <clears throat> and so the doctor begins using the hospital as the place where he or she will mostly he at this time would provide uh, care. And so the hospital is reliant on the doctor to refer patients to the hospital. And so we have this codependence. The physician needs the technology that is too expensive for him to have on his own. Um, and so he refers patients to the hospital. The hospital needs the doctors to refer patients there because the patients aren't going to just show up on their own. Um, so just the remarkable, the importance of technology, I just can't overstate the importance of technology, right? So you, you go from, uh, uh, no, uh, you know, from, from this incredibly primitive level to, to this incredibly, uh, uh, sophisticated and miraculous level. Now the institution of medicine, institutionalization of medicine, right? Medicine starts to work. That's the point when the AMA, the American Medical Association, really gets a foothold because now people are seeing, oh, yeah, antibiotics, they work, you know, uh, oh, we've got anesthesia, I can now actually, you know, have a mastectomy uh, without four guys holding me down um, while somebody cuts my breast off um, or any other kind of procedure uh, with no, you know, anesthesia. Imagine getting up, you know, having a tooth pulled. Well, you used to get tooth pulled, having somebody strap you, you know, having the dentist strap you down while he rips the tooth out of your mouth as fast as he can. Um, so medicine goes from a, you know, a primitive, um, mostly, you know, nonsensical uh, uh, thing to a sophisticated uh, and a functional and, you know, uh, 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 service, right? Um, and so at this time, we see a whole bunch of things starting to change, kind of mid-1800s. We see a whole bunch of things starting to change. Medi medical training becomes more formalized. Um, the AMA starts, you know, succeeding in getting um, licensing requirements state by state. Um, we develop a, a accreditation body for medical training. The Flexner Report, um, is published in 1910. They go around looking at medical schools and they they basically uh, identify all of the medical schools that are are doing bogus training uh, and generating un not not generating properly trained people. Um, and so we see just a, a, a real revolution in medical training. We also begin to see specialization in medicine. And this is something that's really unique about American medicine uh, is there is a about a 60 40 split between specialists and generalists. So, generalists being your family medicine docs, your internal medicine docs, your pediatricians <clears throat> versus, say, your cardiologists and your surgeons. And so, uh, unlike Great Britain, the structure of medicine in the United States didn't develop around primary care. Instead, it really becomes a kind of, um, it really grows into a specialist uh, model. Um, mental health. Evolutions of mental health, um, uh, really profound. Uh, we have, uh, uh, there's very little that we can do for people until the 1960s. And we have uh, the emergence of, of drugs that can actually help start to help treat psychosis and depression. So um, we have the emergence of asylums back in the 1700s. And even before that, for people with mental illness, a lot of them were just barbaric places where people were, were warehoused. Um, but there was literally nothing we could do. Um, we had nothing that actually worked um, for people with uh, severe mental illness um, until the 19, really 1950s. Um, lobotomies, right, where, where, um, which was a procedure where they um, uh, try to separate the lobes of the uh, frontal cortex uh, emerged in the, I want to say the twenties and was a popular treatment for depression, severe depression um, uh, and other kinds of mental illness. And this involves basically, and I, and I do not exaggerate uh, for effect basically involves sticking what amounts to an ice pick through the uh, 
behind someone's eye. So kind of in the corner of your eye, slipping it in through your eye, and then kind of using that to try to separate the, the front portion, the frontal cortex, the front portion of your brain. It's about as barbaric and crude a procedure as you can imagine. And there were plenty of, there was plenty of mortality from this treatment, but it actually worked for some patients. Um, some patients were made better off by it, not all, but some. Uh, and this sort of treatment became quite popular uh, in the early 20th century until the emergence of these psycho, uh, 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 psychoactive drugs uh, that were discovered. And, and then very rapidly that went out of favor uh, because it was just truly barbaric. Um, we have the Community Mental Health Centers Act of 1963, uh, which was meant to try to reduce the number of individuals who had been put into state-run psychiatric facilities, which often were essentially prisons. Um, and so as we found, as we had these drugs um, uh, that were found to actually be somewhat effective, uh, the idea was we no longer needed to have these people locked up. They could now come back into society and have their care managed uh, on an outpatient basis. And so we, there's this whole thing called deinstitutionalization begins. Um, unfortunately, it's one of these things where the pendulum has swung too far in one direction, swings too far in the other direction. And so we see a crash in the number of psychiatric beds available. Um, and people basically who had, you know, been living in these centers for, you know, years or decades were suddenly told, okay, you're, off you go. Um, and often the care on the outpatient side was not there or not enough. And so a lot of these people become homeless or wind up in prison, which is kind of where we're at right now, to be honest, with our society. We have a serious lack of um, psychiatric beds in New Hampshire and across the country. Uh, and, peop and, and most people who are homeless, uh, most people who are homeless have psychiatric illnesses, not all, but most people have psychiatric illnesses and or addiction issues. And we just don't have the bed space to take care of our people. Not everybody who has a psychiatric illness winds up homeless, but what we do see, and this is current, like today, as I talk, what we see are people who are being boarded in emergency departments in New Hampshire for days or even weeks waiting for a psychiatric bed to open up because as a re direct result of this deinstitutionalization movement from the 60s. So we're only now beginning to realize we don't have enough psychiatric beds and we're starting to take action on it. Um, Olmstead versus LC in 1999 required that states actually provide enough um, uh, well, it helped create community-based mental health uh, clinics, uh, but it also required states to like, okay, you got rid of the beds, you actually have to provide community-based mental health care. And New Hampshire is regularly sued by um, various community activists saying, hey, New Hampshire, you're not providing the required um, uh, 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 psychiatric treatment uh, or, or resources for outpatient psychiatric treatment. Um, so three forces that then created the need for health insurance in America. Okay. So we're now let's think about like, why, where did insurance come from? So most of us pay for healthcare with insurance. Well, technology, uh, advanced treatments became available, but they were really expensive social, right? These, these treatments as they became desirable, um, became more accepted, we changed our perspective about going to a hospital. So whereas a hospital, if you were sent to a hospital once upon a time, the reason you were sent there is because you didn't have family that cared about you. Uh, you were basically being abandoned. Um, as hospitals became the high-tech hub of healthcare, it became desirable to get care in a hospital. Well, now you've got to pay for that care because you're not having, you're not getting that care from your, your children, your spouse, your grandparents, whatever. Right. So now you're having to buy that care. And so to buy that care, you need a means for paying for it. Uh, and so economic, right. Uh, forces, of course, again, improvements in technology are expensive. We're now training doctors and nurses to do a better job. That's expensive everything becomes more expensive. And the other thing is with insurance, right? Your healthcare needs 
are unpredictable. Right? I just want to make that point. Like, you don't know if tomorrow you're going to get run over by a bus and need hundreds of thousands of dollars in in medical care. You might, hopefully, you'll never get run over by a bus or some other equi terrible equivalent, cancer, whatever, right? Um, and so insurance is meant to cover those unpredictable needs. But if something terrible has happened to you, <clears throat> you'll want to get that care in a hospital and you'll need the money to pay for that care. And so insurance, it, pure insurance, uh, uh, as I call it, uh, covers those things. So where did it come from? Well, um, in the United States, private health insurance has always been the dominant uh, way of, of delivery. Um, and so we start, started to see, we've always had insurance of various sorts with us, but in 1911, we really kind of see, uh, see blanket insurance policies around things like life, uh, sickness. We have a market with with insurance companies emerging that are willing to pay, that are willing to write um, uh, uh, policies that you could then buy. Uh, 1929 is kind of a hallmark year for medical insurance. This is the year that modern health insurance is born. And it's known as the Baylor plan. Um, Baylor University had a hospital um, uh, in Texas. So Baylor's a university in Texas. I actually used to teach for them. Uh, and they used to have a hospital where they were. Um, and um, at the time, the uh, 1929, we're in the midst of the depression. Uh, the Great Depression is just beginning. And the hospitals are finding, you know, it's too expensive for people to come. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, especially as we're going into the depression. Uh, and so uh, they started offering this thing called a prepaid plan, which basically is like you pay, uh, I think it was like a dollar a week you'd pay uh, out of your paycheck. And if you got sick, you, the plan covered 21 days in, in the Baylor University Hospital. This becomes the model for Blue Cross, um, uh, uh, which you've probably heard of, right? Blue Cross and Blue Shield. So it, it becomes the model for Blue Cross and very quickly becomes... Uh, the industry standard. So people, you know, people across the United States start buying Blue Cross plans that cover hospitalization. Now, the the Blue Cross plan didn't cover covers the cost of the hospital, but doesn't cover the co cost of the care from the doctor. Doctors resisted private uh, resisted health insurance because they were frankly were worried that they wouldn't get paid as much. That it would Im and and they worried that insurance companies would start trying to tell them what kind of care they could give. But in 1939, the California Medical Association creates Blue Shield, um, again, because we're still in a depression um, and physicians are struggling to get paid by their clients. And so they give in. And so we see the emergence of a insurance plan to cover hospital costs and an insurance plan to cover professional or physician services. And that remains as the model today. Um, how did, and I mentioned in our first lecture, uh, uh, the dominant model in the United States is most people get their health insurance from an employer. So how did that come about? Well, World War II, um, uh, 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 Congress passed laws freezing wages in many, um, uh, in many industries. And so they couldn't pay you more in cash. So what they did was they started offering you health to offering to pay your health insurance instead of giving you more cash. Um, and so, so now employees, you know, we're like, okay, well, you can't, I'll, you're going to pay me $10 an hour. Uh, I'd like $12 an hour, but you know what I'll take is instead I'll take an insurance plan that's worth $2 an hour instead. And so that's where, that's how this kind of emerges. And there's a Supreme court decision saying that um, unions could negotiate for health insurance as an, as an item. And then nobody really knows where this IRS tax ruling comes from. Um, but in 1954, uh, an employer, you know, at, basically asked, you know, Hey, if we pay for this, uh, if we pay for our employees, health care, excuse me, health insurance benefits, is that, um, tax exempt from 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 the income of the employee. So, in other words, it does it it does it get added on to their um, to their take home pay, and will the IRS take a percent? So, if I'm if I'm getting ten dollars in wages and two dollar and a 
ten dollars in, in in wages per hour and 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 an insurance benefit that's worth two dollars an hour, and I have to pay twenty percent taxes. Is it going to be twenty percent on ten dollars or is it going to be twenty percent on twelve dollars? And some unknown employee in the IRS wrote back and said, uh, uh, the employee does not have to pay taxes on the value of the health insurance benefit. They just have to pay taxes on their income. And so that has been the stand in ever since. So in a way it's beneficial to you to get your healthcare insurance through your employer, because if you get it through your employer, um, your employer pays you less, but then you don't have to pay taxes on that, um, on the value of your health insurance. All right. National health insurance has been a battle in the United States uh, since the beginning. I'm not going to go into this in, a, in in detail. Your book has a lot about this and you can read about it. Um, but there's been a fight. There's been a fight in the United States forever on creating national health insurance. And so as people looked across the water and saw um, Europe creating national health insurance, um, uh, people wanted it. Basically, physicians and physician groups stopped it from happening. That's the main, that's the real answer. And the reason they did that is because they wanted to protect their income. Um, now, there are a lot of physicians who are fans of a single payer or national health insurance. It's a, you'll hear that phrase, single payer or Medicare for all. Um, uh, those are all models of national health insurance. And there are physicians who are fans of that today. But historically, physician groups have blocked uh, that. Uh, the implementation of those uh, policies. All right. Um, Medicare and Medicaid uh, is created in 1965. Um, uh, and, you know, originally this was also blocked. Um, uh, 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 people, um, there's a game in healthcare policy where anytime you want to do something for poor people, uh, poor and underprivileged people, you have to find a way to give a gift to the middle class as well. So the only way that Medicaid got through was by creating Medicare, which basically everybody gets if you live to be 65. Um, so Medicare is created by uh, Title 18 of the Social Security Act, and it's in two parts. Uh, the original Medicare is in two parts, a part A, which covers the hospital and hospital component, again, like the, the equivalent of Blue Cross, right? And a part B that covers physician bills. Um, and we'll get into more detail on that later when we get into health insurance. Um, but Medicare, there's no class distinction. The wealthy and the poor receive Medicare benefits alike. And by the way, if you're working, you're paying for that right now, right? So if you've got somebody who retires from Goldman Sachs and, and has $50 million in the bank, they're still going to get Medicare. And you who are working a $12 an hour job at some restaurant are paying for that, right? So there's no distinction between wealthy and poor. There is no means testing is what that means, right? So there's no like, hey, how much do you make? Uh, okay, well, if you make below that amount, you get this. There's no means testing for Medicare. Everybody gets it. Um, uh, there's uniform, universal standards. And in the beginning, physicians could balance bill, which meant that um, if Medicare said, hey, we're going to charge you, uh, we're, we're willing to pay $100 for this procedure. And the physician's like, well, I charge 150. What they could do is send, they'd take the $100 from Medicare, and then they'd sell, send you a bill for the balance, hence balance billing. Um, Medicaid was always a um, program for the indigent, right? It's meant to provide people who provide medical care for people who couldn't afford it. Um, and this does have a means test, but it's left up to the state. So the main difference between Medicare and Medicaid is, well, main differences between Medicare and Medicaid is Medicare is a federal program. There is no means test. Everybody qualifies for it when they turn 65 or if they uh, have a disability. Medicaid is a joint program between the um, the states and the federal government. And basically the federal government just sends money to the states to set up their program. So every state runs their program a little bit differently. The means test varies from state to state. So you might qualify for Medicaid in New Hampshire, but not in Massachusetts, or you might in Maine, but not in Vermont, right? And it 
eventually was expanded to include all uh, age groups, not just the, uh, excuse me, and it inclu includes all age groups, not just the elderly poor. Um, so there's a clear class distinction with Medicaid. It does have the stigma of public welfare. Um, and again, the, the eligibility benefits um, vary from state to state. Physicians can't balance bill, um, and but they can, and they can refuse it, right? So a physician can say, I'm not taking Medicaid or I'm not taking any more Medicaid. And that's a common thing and a common challenge. So if you're a Medicaid beneficiary, it can get hard to find someone who was willing to provide you care. Um, health maintenance organizations also emerged during World War II. And a health maintenance organization, <laughs> excuse me, is a program, uh, an insurance program, uh, where uh, it is a more comprehensive program that's focused on providing um, uh, uh, care um, for individuals. Um, but and we'll get more into the details of of what that means. But it emerges in in the I want to say the San Francisco area with Kaiser Permanente. Uh, Kaiser was a um, uh, was a shipbuilder, and so this was the and this was during World War II. So they they contracted for care. So one of the key things about HMOs is um, is the way that physicians are paid, and they're paid on a per capita basis. So uh, if you're a physician and you take and you're part of an HMO, you get paid a flat fee. Um, to provide all of the care for any beneficiaries. Um, this was seen in the 70s as a as a better way to provide care. And we were already realizing um, in the 70s, you know, just a few years after the creation of Medicare, that that Medicare benefit was going to get really expensive as physicians started taking advantage of it. Um, so corporate era, late 1900s to the present, um, what we're seeing is, you know, three major features here, corporatization. So we're going from a single physician, um, you know, hanging out a shingle and working by him, him or herself into big physician groups becoming, you know, companies rather than just individual providers, information and globalization. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so the there's a long history of physician autonomy in the United States. Physicians do have a have a have a real strong streak of you're not the boss of me. Trust me, uh, if you know any physicians, they tend to be real independent, and they don't want um, anybody telling them how to do their healthcare. Now, part of that is their license is always at stake. So you know. Uh, so they have they have a degree of protectiveness around that, but they just you know medicine just generally attracts uh, a, a kind of person that that likes to do their own thing. Um, so we start to see um, what we start to see is technolo technological cost is increasing, the complexity of medicine is increasing, um, insurance companies are starting to squeeze physicians and drive down reimbursement so that physicians are getting paid less for each visit or or procedure that they do. And so in order to negotiate, and then in the 80s in particular, managed care organizations come about to start to control costs. And so um, physicians start to get together uh, uh, to try to be a better able to negotiate with um, uh, insurance companies. So corporatization, so medical care becomes the domain of large corporations, right? So high-tech care and comfortable surroundings, but cost control really still very expensive. Managed care becomes the primary vehicle for insurance delivery. So most people move away from indemnity insurance and towards some sort of managed care where there are negotiations between the um, the insurance company and the providers to set rates. And so if the insurance company is bigger than the provider group, then the insurance company can can muscle the the providers to force them to take lower reimbursement. This was got really ugly in the 80s and early 90s um, uh, as this competition between insurance companies and providers really took off. Um, but we also start to see, because of costs, we start to see integrated healthcare organizations um, to try to counteract managed care, you know, the insurance companies um, uh, 
uh, uh, negotiating power. And so hospitals start buying physician practices, physicians group up into large clinics or hospital partnerships in order to negotiate back. Um, Another big piece happening here is the information revolution. So this happens in the 80s as computers uh, take off and we have, you know, and today we have telemedicine and telehealth saw an explosion of that uh, through COVID e-health, right? So uh, probably some of you have had um, telemedicine um, uh, visits, but e-health is even goes beyond that. So some of you probably have you know, Apple iWatches and the, the technology on an Apple iWatch can track your heart and can do an EKG in a, in a, you know, at a quality that not that long ago, you would have had to go to a doctor's office to get. So things are changing and technology is changing and it's causing uh, changes in the way that we deliver care. Electronic health records is another one. I don't have it on the slide. But doctors used to keep all their notes on paper. Today, electronic health records are the standard. That's been a thing that's been pushed by um, uh, also by the ACA. Um, electronic health records are incredibly expensive, but they have what, what we call a very high fixed cost, which means like it costs you, say, a million dollars to implement an electronic health record. Um and so if you have one physician, that's a million dollars per physician. But if you have a hundred physicians, that's a million dollars divided by a hundred, right? So you're spreading that cost um, uh, uh, with electronic health records. Um, so it becomes much less expensive, So, which is another reason why we're seeing groups emerging. Um, another force is globalization. We're, again, telemedicine, right? If I can do a visit over the, over the internet, um, across town, well, I can do a, a, a then I can do a telemedicine visit from literally anywhere in the world. So we're seeing that we're seeing medical tourism. There are hospitals in um, Asia and India in particular that are staffed by uh, U.S. trained physicians and nurses who then go back to India, uh, set up these hospitals, and they can do. Uh, you can go to India and say get <clears throat> get a major medical. Um, a major medical procedure done for a tenth of the cost of what it would be to get it done in the United States. And you can recover in a five-star or four-star hotel, whatever they're, you know, a, a, a beautiful luxury hotel, uh, all for less than what it would cost to get it done in the United States. So that's medical tourism. We're seeing um, uh, all kinds of collaborations uh, across, uh, across, countries. Um, and so the last phase, the era of healthcare reform um, is all driven by cost, right? So what we see is the cost of healthcare just keeps going up and up and up, as I talked about way in the first lecture. And so health reform, efforts at health reform are trying to create, um, you know, figure out a way to address the issues of cost, quality and access. And the United States is just not a country that that wants, you know, we are a whole country with a lot of people that that tend to say you're not the boss of me, right? And we've got a constitution that says that the federal government isn't the boss uh, of most economic activity in the United States. So trying to come up with a standardized program of healthcare in the United States is extremely complicated. And I, I you know, want to go back to that point that I made. We're the third largest population in the world. You can do a lot if you're a tiny little country, you know, a national health insurance thing, if your country is 500,000 people like Iceland, right? But if you want to create a national health insurance when you're 330 million people but, and get everybody to feel like they're getting the, a fair shake and getting the kind of care that they want, that's a very different proposal, right? Um, so the PPACA, the uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, um, uh, was characterized by kind of a, a, a number of kind of predecessors. We had CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Program, which basically expanding Medicaid to cover children. Um, we had Medicare Prescription Drug Improvement and Modernization Act of 2003, uh, known as Part D, Medicare Part D, which provides a drug benefit because in the past, Medicare provided hospital insurance and provider insurance, but it didn't cover your drugs. And as we, you know, drugs are becoming an ever larger part 
of healthcare today, and they're extremely expensive. Uh, some predecessors of the ACA included the Oregon Health Plan and the Massachusetts Health Plan, uh, developed by then Senator Romney, um, excuse me, uh, then Governor Romney, who then later becomes Senator Romney from Utah, ran against Obama, right? Um, so then we have the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Don't worry, we're coming into the we're coming into the end here. Um, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act passed in um, uh, 2010 uh, uh, was a highly partisan piece of legislation. Um, it was uh, a, not a single Republican voted in favor of it. A lot of deals were passed. The AMA reversed its stance, uh, its historic uh, opposition to health care reform. Um, because they could see the writing on the wall that, you know, healthcare was just becoming too expensive. And if they didn't get on board, they, they'd get left out. Um, really, uh, uh, there wasn't a lot known, uh, Senator, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 Congresswoman, uh, Pelosi, you know, classically said, we have to pass the bill to find out what's in it, uh, which is a terrible way of doing legislation. And the ACA is, in my opinion, is a bit of a hot mess, uh, but it has done some good. Um, uh, it was challenged multiple times by the Supreme Court, uh, in particular uh, over the individual mandate. Um, but, and then a lot of uh, Medicaid expansion. So we said, I said in the first lecture, that we've seen uh, about a halving, meaning cutting in half, the number of people without without insurance, um, without medical insurance in the United States. Most of that reduction came from the expansion of Medicaid. So more people were, were uh, allowed to qualify for Medicaid, but that required cooperation state by state. Um, the main reforms uh, for the ACA included uh, insurers, excuse me, employers had to provide health insurance to full-time employees. Um, it entitled uh, adult children to stay on their plans until they were 26, um, which for me, uh, you know, is great for my kids because I've got two kids who are under the age of 26. Uh, but I just find kind of bonkers because like at what point really we're not an adult until we turn 26, I find kind of offensive. Um, but hey, it works, you know, for me on an individual basis. Um, it expanded the eligibility for Medicaid, gave the opportunity to expand the ability for Medicaid. We're going to talk more about community rating um, uh, 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 later um, and a lot more. So the aftermath, you know, we saw a reduction of uninsured from 48 to 28 million, 48 million to 28 million, though really most of that was Medicaid expansion. So that kind of begs the question of couldn't, instead of passing this like crazy comprehensive policy, couldn't we have just expanded Medicaid? Um, uh, but uh, uh, what we did see, you know, and this is where I, I say it's done some good, right? More people have health insurance. That's good. Uh, but the individual, you know, uh, uh, market premium. So the money that you, so a premium is the amount that you pay for your health insurance. The average individual market premium doubled in cost. Uh, so, so we went from, you know, uh, I, I have friends who are, you know, it was like a, a professional photographer who buys, buys his own health insurance, went from paying $500 a month for his health insurance to a thousand dollars a month for his health insurance. That's tough to, to, that's a tough pill to swallow. Right, and he didn't really get anything more as a result. Um, and the other thing it did was it dramatically reduced the number of insurance companies. So insurance comp big insurance companies got behind this uh, because it um, the requirements for health insurance health insurers, and we'll talk more about this in a later in the later chapter, um, uh, forced health, basically uh, reduced the amount of profit that, or, or the administrative costs that insurance companies could have. So only big companies could um, manage their programs at the level of, of um, administrative costs per beneficiary. And so as a result, we saw a culling um, of, of health insurance companies that were smaller run by, you know, 
mom and pop shops that provided did provide a legitimate service. It's just uh, they just couldn't compete in the new ACA environment. And so we only saw the large, only the largest firms have survived. So this is a real gift to the big health insurance firms. All right. So that is a long lecture, but um, that's going to, this is going to be the grounding for much of the rest of our discussion.